want to go back and remind us all of something that Frank said when he started the meeting off, was that um, God took Paul and he sent him to the Gentiles. And this is a huge step. The question that has to, you, know, you have to have in your mind is like, why did God choose us? Why are you here today? What is it special about you that God said, I want to make sure that... And it's, it's mind-blowing to think that God would even take thought of us. But he did. He sent Paul to the Gentiles. Jesus came for the shepherds. Like, we're all just here because God just loves us. Nothing special. I just love that. I really, really love that. If you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, whatever it is you want to use, and you want to turn over to Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 10. Matthew 5, starting at verse 10. There's something really cool here. Um, starting in verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just a couple little things to note in here. If you're being persecuted because you did something stupid, you're not blessed for that. You're blessed for the, being persecuted for doing something for the sake of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast um, insults, at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven will be great. I just kind of hold all these little things, these thoughts in the back of your head for later. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. If salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It's good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure, but on the lampstand so it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I can't tell you how many times I've, read, I've actually read that passage of Scripture and said, that's really cool, and then just moved on. This week when I read it, it was like, um, like getting hit in the forehead with a paintball gun. It was like... Um, okay, what's going on here? We are so used to this world that we live in that we can't put ourselves in the world that was there when Jesus was speaking to these people. How many of you have at least a dozen spices in your cabinet, in your kitchen? They didn't have that. They didn't have all the spices and stuff that we use. They had salt. It was very precious to them. It wasn't just something that made food taste better. It was also something that preserved food because they didn't have refrigerators or ice boxes, as they were called when I was a little child. They didn't have anything to preserve food. They used salt to preserve food. Salt was precious. How many of you, last time the electricity went off in your house and everything went dark, that you went over into a room and you hit the light switch on anyway? Have you ever done that? Like, it's just so human, it's just so ingrained into us. You want light, you turn on a switch. Everywhere we go in this world, we have as much light as we want. It, as we, want. we even have flashlights on our phones. We have light everywhere we want it. They had none. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have flashlights. They didn't have batteries. If they wanted light, they had to make a fire. They had nothing. They couldn't, it's very difficult to take a fire with you. When you're walking around, light was precious. So when Jesus comes to them and says, you are the salt, or he says to them, you are the light of the world, this was like, we? We're lights? Wow. That is a, a tremendous calling. We're the light of the world. If you had the only flashlight in town, do you think people would want to hang out with you? Yeah. Yeah. We're the light of the world. This is what he's basically saying here. And if you turn over to, to verse 45, Matthew 5, verse 45, I'm going to put a couple things together here. He says, let your light shine. How do we do that? Verse 45, he says that he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know that I love to interpret the scripture, and put it in today's language. What Jesus is literally saying here, and you can quote me on this, get me as much trouble as you want, he's literally saying here is that manure occurs. 
maneuver occurs. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. It happens. Bad things happen. Why? Jesus said bad things are going to happen. The rain falls, the sun falls, righteous and the unrighteous. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. The reason why God allows manure to occur is for various reasons... Life has a purpose for us. If you think it just happens and it's, there's no reason, no purpose in it, I really feel sorry for you. Then you really need to come to know the Lord because everything that happens in your life has a purpose. God has a purpose for everything in your life. That's what I love about, about my Lord is I never wake up thinking that my day, my life, anything about me is, is, has no meaning. It has tremendous meaning. Why he chose me, I have no idea. But everything has a purpose. Every day has a purpose. Number one, it, the circumstances can change us if we let them. They can literally change our lives. And when I say change us, I mean that all the promises that we have in God, Psalm 1, blessed is the man, doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, but he walks in the ways of the Lord. He will be blessed and he will prosper. So if we let God use the circumstances, he will change us and set us free from all the manure that occurreth inside us. And when that happens, then the circumstances can begin to use us to help others. And then the light begins to shine. We go from people like saying, oh, woe is me, this, why does this have to happen to me, to how can I help somebody else in this bad situation? Whatever it is. When we talk about bad situations, you can talk about something that can be just as little, little as there's a fly in the room. My wife hates flies. In Italian, they're called mucas, I think. She's always saying, mucca, mucca. She really annoys her. There's a, one fly in the entire room. Three o'clock in the morning, I will be woken up. Mucca, get the mucca. She hates flies. But it can go all the way to having a really bad diagnosis. C circumstances abound. But one thing that always happens, regardless of how little or how large it is, circumstances bring out the real us. The real us. There's an us that we bring to church and that we present to everybody. There's the us that we want everybody to think of us as. But circumstances reveal the real us. What's really inside. I know I, I've told many times a story when we were playing softball and, and I was playing center field and, and the game was on the line. There was two guys on base and there was two outs and, and, and the ball was hitting. It, I just didn't think I was going to get it. And I started running from, from as fast as I possibly could. And, I, and as I'm running, I am yelling out, manure! Except there wasn't manure. And the entire Cantine field complex heard me do it. What was really here just came out. Circumstances do that. You hit your, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a narrow, there's a narrow doorway at work. And for whatever reason, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't have this problem because you're much smarter than I am, but I would always hit my elbow, that little bone right on the outside of your elbow, on the door jam. And when I would do that, it just started to build up and started to get sore and sore as each day went on. And most of you would learn to pull your elbow in as that began to happen, but I didn't. And then I would hit it, and I would, and what was inside was starting to come out. It can be little things like that. We try to hide, but when things like that happen, our true nature comes out of us. We start yelling. Start yelling. We get emotion. We start yelling. So like Linda and I, are ha we have these conversations, and... Um, She's upstairs, so I can say this. So she, we have this conversation, and um, she'll start raising her voice. And I really don't like that. So I would point it out to her. You know, you're raising your voice right now. And she, I'm not raising my voice. <laughs> so I downloaded a decibel app from my iPhone. <laughs> this is a true story. 
and I started to like record her so that after a couple sentences I say, well, apparently according to this app, your voice is three times louder now than it was a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> Again, see, you can see that I'm not quite as intelligent as you are because that didn't work at all. Did not work at all. Things inside us start coming out. Fear comes out. All of a sudden, we become afraid. We didn't, think we, we didn't think we were afraid of anything. Stress that gets bottled up, anger, sadness, all kinds of things that are in there comes out because bad circumstances do that to us. And yet, Jesus promised us the fruit of the Spirit if we walk in the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. You can stop right there and just say, if I had those four things every time something bad happened to me, I'd be boom, pretty good. Love, joy, peace, patience. Every time something bad happens to me, flat tire. <gasps> Love, joy, peace, patience. I'd be pretty good. I once had a customer come into the shop, and uh, he's talking to me, and he was a very difficult customer. He was a difficult person. But he must have sensed or knew that he was a difficult customer because he, um, after talking to me for a couple of minutes, he goes, you know, you have ferocious patience. And I'm like, I don't even know what ferocious patience is. But what he was sensing was I was disciplining myself to be patient with this guy. It's an interesting thing. I just want, I want to know here something I felt like God said to me at doing, putting this together is that God doesn't want to change your personality. He made you the way you are. He loves you the way you are. He doesn't want to change your personality. What he wants to change is your heart and the way you respond. And he wants to put fruits of the Holy Spirit inside you. He doesn't want to change you to be somebody else. He just wants his fruits to start coming forth in you so that you can be a light to this world. Because you know what? If you have love, joy, peace, patience, and every time you encounter a bad circumstance, I'm going to guarantee you you're going to be a light because nobody's got it. The world is so painfully short on love, joy, peace, and patience. The bottom line is that part of his true promise to us is that he's going to change us so he can set us free. What do we want? We don't want him to do that using bad circumstances. What we want is a pill. Give me a pill and make this go away. Talking to a doctor recently, he suggested that I become a doctor. And I said, I could never, ever do that. Besides the fact I'd be 80 years old by the time I became one. I could never, ever do that. I said, because I couldn't tolerate people coming to me with problems and they just want a pill to make it go away. They don't want to do anything to change it. I, sorry that I said it to him because I actually depressed him. He was like, oh yeah, that's not good. Oh. <laughs> We don't want to work at anything. So when I was in high school and I played football, my, um, our football team was decent. We were a pretty good team. And my football, high school football coach came from southern Vermont in farming area. And he's got this team and he's really proud of us and we're, really, we're doing pretty good. And so, and so you know, we lived, I lived like in a, you know, a village like Saugerties, really like Saugerties. We wasn't a farmer um, at the time. And so he takes his team on a bus and we travel an hour and a half to go into southern Vermont to play against a rural high school. Nothing but farmers lived there. And we got out into the field, in that football field, and, and one of my positions was offensive tackle. And I line up against this guy that's about two inches shorter than I am and probably about 10, 15 pounds lighter than I am. I was not a big guy. Six feet tall, only weighed 160 pounds in high school. And I lined up against this little guy, and I thought to myself, this is going to be fun because I'm going to push this guy all over the place. And I'm going to be making holes for my team. We're going to have a blast today. And when that ball was hiked and first snap was made, that guy hit me so hard <laughs> that I laid on my back, and my, and my quarterback got sacked from him, didn't even have a chance to hand the ball off, and he looked over to me and said, Scotty, what is going on? And I didn't know the answer, because I, like, I didn't know what happened. I got hit so hard, I didn't even know what happened. So we had the next play. Same thing happened. And I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. This guy's twice as strong as I am. He is really, really strong. They beat us 47 to nothing. 
And it wasn't just my fault, the whole team. They were strong. You know why they were strong? Because muscles grow when you strain them. Do you know what farmer kids did back then? They shoveled manure, they handled hay bales. Everything they did was by hand, and they did it, and it was hard work. They strained their muscles. No pain, no gain when it comes to muscles. Muscles get bigger and stronger when you strain them. The fibers break, and then the body begins to fill in the breaks of the fiber with more muscle tissue. You don't work it, you don't strain it, you don't pain it, it doesn't grow. That's the way it is. Well, guess what? Now, scientists are realizing that it's the same thing for our brains. They're discovering that with Alzheimer's, that if you actually exercise it and really discipline your mind to do things that's never done before, like when you retire, don't go start watching TV, pick up a musical instrument. Start painting. Start doing Go dancing. They, oh, here's a good one for you guys. They actually talk about people getting together and talking. I know. Not texting, not Facebooking, but actually talking. So you actually have to use your brain on how to immediately respond to somebody. And they said for, that, for those people, Alzheimer's was a huge decline in the amount that they had. Huge decline. No strain, no gain. When it comes to your brain, I'm telling you right now in the spirit, the same thing goes with your heart. The same thing goes with your heart. Unless you embrace the rain, the manure that God brings into your life, you're not going to grow. You're just not going to grow. There's no pill that makes that happen. So I'm just going to give you really quickly five steps to how to change the way you respond to bad circumstances. Five steps on how to do that. Okay, you ready? Five steps. How to... Change the way you respond to bad circumstances so you can have the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Number one, don't do anything. Okay. Number one, don't do anything. That's, yeah. yeah, don't even write it down. No, don't do anything. <laughs> There's a guy at the bowling alley. You know what, I should just back up and just say this. If you like to see people, how they respond in bad situations, you should come out and hang out the bowling alley. It's really quite a sight. I, I once had a guy who, he was a good bowler. Things weren't going well for him that day. And, and, and I, I was, he was behind me, and he picked up one of the chairs of the bowling alley and put it over his head and slammed it on the floor right behind me, and it broke into pieces. I made sure I knew where he was in proximity to me for the rest of the day. People do crazy things when things don't go their way. And bowling alley is a really good place to see it. This one guy at the bowling alley a couple of months ago, we're bowling, it's Sean Weaver's his name, if you, ever, if you know him, pray for him. He said, uh, after a couple of shots, he goes, it was my turn to get up, he goes, hey, Iceman, it's your turn. I'm like, Iceman? I was like, oh, am I a Viking? I don't understand what, what, you know. He goes, no. I said, why are you calling me Iceman? He goes, because you never react. You never react. Good shot, bad shot, you don't react. I'm like, hmm. There's a reason. <laughs> yeah, hmm. I didn't react. Because in bowling, for those of you who've ever done it, you can make like a really, really good shot and it can look absolutely perfect. And you could take that shot, and 10 times in a row, that shot will be a perfect strike. And then you can make that shot, the same exact shot, and all of a sudden be left with a split. And when you do that, sometimes the game can be on the line. And your friends will say, we really need you to get one on this right here. And you throw the perfect shot, and there's a split. And you just lost the game. You have to learn to do nothing first so that you have time for yourself to think about what you should be doing. If you allow yourself to do something, it'll probably be wrong. So become an ice man and give time for your spirit to think about the next step, which is coming. Time for prayer, time for thought, time for peace, waiting, patience. We're, we're asking for patience. Learn to do nothing and wait. Number two, Everybody's, everybody's seen it. It's all over everywhere. Number two, what would Jesus do? Yep, it's really that simple. Part of prayer of number one is saying, Lord, what do you want me to do here? Lord, what do you want me to do here? 
Jesus did it when they brought before him the woman that was caught in adultery. He did nothing. And then he started to, to pray by drawing in the sand. What do you want me to do? And after several minutes of doing that, the Holy Spirit told him exactly what to do. And he had wisdom so he could act on it. So if that's what you need to do, the second step is what would you do, Jesus? What do you want to do? Sometimes people say, you know what, that's hypocrisy. Like in your heart, you're feeling angry, but instead, Jesus is telling you to be nice to that person. So you're being a hypocrite. I want to explain something to you. It's very, very important. A hypocrite is somebody that puts on a show. They have no intentions of changing inside. They have no intentions of changing. They're going to pretend they like you. Inside they hate you and they want to hate you the rest of their life. But a Christian is somebody who puts on the attributes of God. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, put on God's love. Like a coat. Put it on. What would Jesus do? Jesus would love. Okay, it's not what I'm feeling, but that's what I'm going to do. Guess what happens? Guess what happens? You start to change in your heart. Because you're not being a hypocrite, you want to change, God starts to let that work happen. You strain your heart, you make a change, it changes for the better. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I'm going to let you know a little secret on marriage. I don't always feel like being a good husband. No. I know. It's really surprising. <laughs> Thank you for that. I don't always feel like it. I don't always feel like loving. When, we're in a, when she's yelling at me, I'm not really feeling like, where's the love? I feel like getting out the app, you know, and measuring how loud she's yelling at me. You know, I'm going to prove this in pure logic. You're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> That's what I'm feeling. What would Jesus do? And every time... I do what he tells me to do. I reap the rewards of it. It always turns out good. And I'm changing. I'm changing. It's really, really cool. Reap it and get changed. Grow up. Grow up. Number three. Get a better perspective on what's going on. Get a better perspective on what's really going on. When we read those scriptures that Jesus said about being a light and being a salt, and that manure occurs, he said, remember your reward in heaven is great. That is one perspective that you have to have. This life isn't about this life. This life is about a job we have to do. Our reward, our paycheck, comes in heaven. It's not just a place, it's a reward. Get a better perspective. This bad thing that's going on in your life right now is a time for you to sow. It's a time for you to plant seeds for things that you can reap later. That's a better perspective. This is a time for you to work at things that you can reap later. It's a time of sowing. Sometimes people, people say things, well, it's always better to remember that you know, it could be worse. Yeah, you know, it, you know, but it depends on the circumstances. I don't like to use that because... What you're feeling right now could be 100%, and it, it could be in a worse situation. You wouldn't feel any worse or any better. But, but the perspective of knowing, so what happens when I'm up there and I throw a, a really, really good ball and I get a split when I least want it? My perspective, because I've learned to, to go over this over and over again, how many times did I throw a ball that wasn't very good and I got a strike? How many times? I can guarantee, I, when I say that to the other guys, they have no idea because they weren't counting. But I count. And I'm like, there's a strike I didn't deserve. I'm going to remember that one for later. Get a better perspective on what's going on right now. People believe, people believe in the Murphy's Law. You ever heard of Murphy's Law? Yeah. If it, anything bad could happen, it will. And Murphy's Law doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It, I think it was made up by some really depressed character. But um, Murphy's Law doesn't exist. That's somebody that's seeing only the bad everywhere they go. Having a really good perspective is called having wisdom. It's called having maturity to see things are different and where it fits. I also just want to really mention that having a better perspective and knowing what's really doesn't negate 
grieving over something bad happened. It doesn't negate grieving. It just gives you wisdom in how to handle it. The wisdom that comes when we allow God to begin to work that into our life is then when James, James says, I've said it so many times in the last few months, the scripture goes, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. The word consider there is a really key word. Circle it, because it doesn't say just have joy. It says consider it. Have perspective. Gain wisdom. Figure out what it's all about. Figure out the whole perspective of what you're going through, what it's all about, what the purpose is in your life, what the purpose is in your neighbor's life. And when you can do that, the wisdom will give you joy. It doesn't change your feelings, but it changes your response. Number four, give thanks. We sing a song that I love, really love the song a lot. It talks about the presence of the Lord. And I don't know if, if, if a lot of us really understand it, but it's in his presence that we get changed. It's in his presence that the fruits of the Spirit are, are, are made into our hearts. It's when we allow to come into his presence. And Psalm 100 says that we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, or maybe it's the other way around, I, I forget. But it's, it's having praise and thanksgiving that puts us into the, into the place of being in the presence of God. And when you're in his presence, things change. Our hearts being one of them. It's really, ba- it's really important to, to see that. That you'll begin, if, just, you just, if you don't know anything else to do and you can't see any better perspective, just begin to praise him and thank him and come into his presence. So he can start to speak to you and minister to you. There was a, um, couple, about a month ago, at Stuart's 6.30 in the morning, it's been very warm lately, but at that time, about a month ago, it was about 28 degrees that morning. It was really cold, and it was 6.30. It was just, just getting light, and I was at Stewart's over here by the thruway. And as I was coming out of the store, this woman comes in really quickly from the thruway, and she dr- drives in front of the air hose pump, and, she, and it, was, there was also, um, it was just really damp and cold, and, and she wasn't wearing a jacket or a sweater or anything, and she gets out of her car, and she's trying to figure out which tire is... Oh, and she's got, a, she's got a, her warning light came on her dashboard. And she's heading up to Albany or somewhere. She's really dressed up and, and so forth. But there she was, and she just had no idea what she was doing. And so I stopped what I was doing, and I went over to help her, right? And um, so, you know, here she, she's having this bad situation. And, and so what I just did was I stopped and said, well, let me help you with that, you know? And I, and I did it for her. And then she's like, oh, thank you so much. And then she started to drive away, and then she stopped, she came back, and she goes, all right, who are you? You know, what, what's going on here? Who are you? So I just, I had a family, I know, I had a family, of, yeah, I was hope, hoping I wouldn't. Anyway, I had this family of, of hope business card on me, so I handed it to her. And I said, you know, hey, I said, God loves you, you know. The, the cool thing here, and this is, this is about step five, is step five is begin to reap the change that God's doing in your heart. Begin to reap it. That's what step five is. You're going to start reaping all of those things before. And when you reap it, take advantage of it and let God use it for you and for others. That's what step five is. Let him begin to use it. I, I've, been, I've had a flat tire on the New Jersey turnpike at 11 o'clock at night. I know what it's like to... and I. I just, I felt sorry for her. And so this is what God wants to do in our hearts is he wants to turn us into thinking about ourselves. Like this is a really crappy morning. I'm really cold and I've got to go to work again. And blah, blah. Instead of this poor woman's got a bad tire and I need to help her. You can begin to reap it. And that's what it's going to be to let your light shine. You musicians want to come back up? So I just want to challenge you today. You see, believers or fans of Jesus just simply, they know what to believe to go to heaven, they go to church, but they're missing out on the real promise of God. And that is, he doesn't just want you to have light to shine for him, he wants to change your heart to set you free. We sang a song about chains, loosen the chains, loosen your grip. It's those things that are inside us that are holding us bondage. 
the anger, the, the emotion, the yelling, the fear, the sadness, all these things are, are holding us bondage that God wants to set us free from. These things are just are going to set our hearts onto, okay, if I do these things, he's going to set me free. And guess what? When that happens, I get to be a light for Jesus. I want to challenge you. You want a pill to fix the things in your heart? Or do you want to allow God's circumstances to change your heart and let that happen to you? We can't stop the rain, but we can add the love, joy, and the peace and the patience. We can add those things to it. So I really don't think that it's just by accident that you are here today. If you're here today, you're here because God is calling you to be a light in this world. Embrace it and become that light.